we have no uh, known motive at this time. However, we're not overruling any possibility. How about leads? We have several leads that we're working on, and uh, some of them have uh, been expired. We have uh, ruled them out. Have you been able to determine whether or not there was one or more assailants? We felt uh, up until this time there's possibly one, but uh, we uh, recovered a, a different caliber shell hole in uh, the vehicle that wasn't there before. What kind of youngsters were these? The boy was an Eagle Scout. Uh, the girl was on her first date, and there's no uh, record of any uh, misbehavior on either one of them. Why did this happen? It was a senseless uh, murder, I believe. The, the only thing to me, this, this came out since then, but he told me at that time that he had killed a guard getting out of a prison. And so I did a, uh, take him as a killer. Uh, to me, a killer isn't a normal person, so I assumed at the time that something was wrong, but as far as uh, a, uh, a psychopath or, or any other aberration, I really didn't, didn't realize at the moment I wasn't concerned because I was cooperating with him and I expected that he would cooperate with me. And I tried to uh, be as accommodating under the circumstances as possible to save the girl any, you know, any harm. He told me that uh, just to come up slowly, put up our hands, that uh, he wanted our money. And I actually laughed at the moment because I, I told him, I says, I've only got 75 cents in my pocket. And I says, you're welcome to have it. But if you need help, I'm sure I can give you help otherwise. And I asked him what his problem was. And he mentioned that he was uh, a convict trying to get to Mexico and needed money and transportation. And I offered him assistance. I told him what I was doing in school and that uh, if, he, if I could be of any assistance whatsoever, I offered him my phone number anything like this, and this just isn't what he wanted. He said he wanted money, and I was really sorry. I said, uh, you've got to check. If, if I'd really like to help you if you would be willing to accept help. He said, well, what I need right now is to get you tied up. And so uh, he had the girl tie me, and of course she was real nervous and tied me rather loosely. And uh, he came and he tightened the knots up, and then he tied her up. And uh, we continued a dialogue along most of this time. And uh, he... Uh, I happened to hear some uh, rustling in behind us, and I asked her to look because she was facing that direction. I was facing toward the water, and I asked her uh, to note, you know, what was going on. And she said, "Oh, there's a man walking around there." And she became concerned about it. And I said, "Well, you know, actually, don't worry about it. It's some. There's a lot of people, picnickers, etc." And just, to, you know, if he kept coming, uh, let me know. And uh, she kind of kept watching. I noticed she wasn't following my conversation. And, she told me he was stepping behind a tree, and the tree was about 30 feet behind us. And when he came out, she said, he's got a mask on. And that was my first inkling that there was anything actually wrong going on. He came, I turned around, and, and we were both uh, still sitting, sitting down. Can you describe for us what your attacker looked like? Well, when he was standing up, he kind of would shift onto one. He acted like a very nervous person. He was uh, of medium to short height, uh, kind of uh, pouchy. Uh, real casually, casual, I don't want to say sloppily, but casually, real casually dressed, uh, of course real dusty from the, uh, the lake, and he had this black hood on, came clear down to here. Just little slits in the eyes, and where, you know, these clip-on glasses, they were clipped into those little uh, loops. Uh, you remained conscious through the entire ordeal. How long was it until help finally came? Well. As soon as he got us, of course, uh, Cecilia and I prayed that, you know, that whatever the Lord wished, that uh, 
that could be expedient and that you know we were you know willing to to do whatever he had in mind but we also realized that that half the battle was going to have to be ours that we were going to have to help ourselves and uh, I, I got to, was able to untie one of her hands, but she was too weak to untie me at that time. So I, I scooted into a position where I could be looking out across the lake. And after calling several times, I found one position that had a little more echo to it that I thought was a little louder. And I called, and several boats went by, but they didn't stop. I don't know if they thought we were joking or what. But finally, one fisherman who was going real slow, uh, he stopped. He shut off his motor, and we, we cajoled and called, and we, we did everything to try to get him to come. And he sat there for about 15 minutes. And he, uh, he did finally uh, come closer, but he wouldn't come to the shore. I guess he was afraid that the man might still be around. He said he'd go get help. But I assumed he was like, you know, so many of the things we read about, he just didn't want to get involved. And so I decided that we were going to have to do this on our own. So I got encouraged her enough to get me untied. And uh, I got one wrist loose so that I could get the rest untied. And then I untied her. And then we were, she still was so weak that she couldn't move. How were, you finally, how were you finally found? Well, she was found down on the blanket still. I, I we made it up about uh, 300 yards up, up almost to the road. And I'd, it was a slow process because I kept black. I couldn't see. You know, I kept blacking out. And my legs kept getting weak. But I was getting progress. I, I think I could have made it to the road. But a, a, a pickup truck was coming along with these dirt roads. And apparently this man had called for help. And uh, he picked me up and, and took me back down to the girl. I want Zodiac to know what I look like, that's all. Why, what do you want to do with this man? I want him to make an attempt on me, that's I hope. And that way the police can at least get him. Do you think by some, doing something like you're doing here that you can attract a man like Zodiac? I hope so, let's put it that way. Let's hope so. No, we're just about in the same position. We're still following a tremendous amount of leads. Uh, we're getting a tremendous amount of information every day, not only from the Bay Area, but from all over the nation. Uh, as you know, we have heard from him uh, ourselves through our local press, and uh, recently he has written to an attorney here in San Francisco. But uh, as far as any specific uh, piece of physical evidence or any sp specific individual, we're no closer than we were. Do you have any explanation for the fact that you've got 40 unsolved murders this year? Well, of course, that is a, a figure that practically ref reflected the number that we used to have in past years. But uh, a big thing in this uh, type of murder is the uh, lack of connection between the suspect and the victim in these cases. In other words, in your robbery-type cases, there's no connection between them. Uh, the average uh, homicide in itself uh, usually involved a family-type argument or a, a sex triangle, and uh, normally the, the perpetrators were on the premises. They weren't too difficult to solve. In past years, we would solve maybe all but one or two murders in San Francisco. But with this new type of homicide where there's no connection, 
between the victim and the perpetrator, uh, they're very difficult to solve. Uh, if we aren't able to obtain any uh, physical evidence at the scene, uh, many of them do go unsolved. San Francisco doesn't appear to be a violent city, at least not from here, but her suicide and alcoholism rates have always been high, and now murder has been added to the list. There is obviously more unhappiness here than meets the eye, and more violence too. Spencer Michaels, KCRA News, San Francisco. I think a man that's going into a storm, and it, uh, it, it squares away uh, with the pattern of uh, the man from what objectively know, we know that uh, Zodiac did. But the thing that bothered... Oh, heavens, with the doctor, the, the people that have called in here that want to give him medical help, he's not going to go to trial until that we know that this man is, the, is, is a human being in, in front of a judge. In other words, he's got to get his headaches uh, cured. That This man, uh, objectively, without even seeing him, I think any uh, psychiatrist would say that this man is sick, sick, sick. I can say there'll be no capital punishment, but I can't speak for the district attorney. And that's the reason I can't make any assurance until I go down and talk to Fern. And then uh, he represents San Francisco more officially than I do, and it's up to him then to take it from there. As to the... Do you think it might be worth making a deal just to capture the man? To capture the man? That would be up to the police officers and law enforcement. We would like to see the man who is the killer apprehended, but I have nothing as of now to inform this office or guarantee this office that they're bringing the man who committed these horrible crimes to our attention. Nothing came of that. We went out to the location where the meat was to have been. Mr. Belli was out there, Mr. Dunbar was out there, and nobody appeared. Can you tell us where that was? That was in the, uh, a little out of San Francisco, in the outer end of the Mission District. Do you explain that it was the Zodiac who called that program this morning? Not necessarily. I listened to the program. My opinion, my, for what it's worth, my, my opinion is that this is no hoaxer, no prankster, the man on that show I sincerely believe has a problem, has a mental problem, but he may or may not have been the so-called Zodiac person. So no one knows yet if they had the Zodiac killer on the phone. They'll have witnesses listen to a tape of the broadcast to determine that. But it seems that a solution to the five Zodiac murders is just as far away as it was before. Spencer Michaels, KCRA News, San Francisco. Listeners to KGO Television's AM talk show heard a voice this morning purporting to be that of the Zodiac Killer. The man phoned the show after advising police last night that he would and would want to talk with attorneys Melvin Belli or F. Lee Bailey. Belli showed up and listened while a man, who said to call him Sam, asked, what will they do with me? I don't want to go to the gas chamber. He complained of headaches and he groaned as if in pain. The attorney and show host Jim Dunbar made a date to meet the caller later in the morning at an undisclosed location. A caller's plea to avoid the gas chamber was taken up at the Hall of Justice with the district attorney who said he could not make a deal. Belli, Dunbar, and the chief of inspectors went to meet the caller south of San Francisco. They waited 45 minutes with no contact, and the police came back with this report.
Well, since the case has, has broken, we've had uh, numerous men assigned to the investigation, as high as 12 at some times, and dropped off to the, the original men, uh, Inspectors Armstrong and Inspectors Toski, who are handling the case. Uh, of course, uh, they have an intimate uh, relationship. There's no question about it. When you work so closely and you're involved in so much within the case, you feel that you recognize it and you feel that you know the individual. And uh, they are uh, out of town today. They're pursuing leads in the investigation. They've, we've never dropped it. We've continued along. Actually, uh, we've correlated the investigation with uh, all Northern California law enforcement agencies, and uh, I might add we've uh, received wonderful cooperation from the CII in Sacramento as well as our uh, local uh, FBI headquarters. What about the cryptogram in the letter? Does it tell you anything new about him? Well, this uh, letter that we've received is just a short uh, cryptogram, uh, one line of symbols, uh, which he says reveals his name. Uh, in the original uh, correspondence we received from the Zodiac, he stated that his name was in it. Uh, the cryptogram in that uh, uh, letter was broken, uh, except for the last 18 letters, and uh, we have been unable to break it. We since received another correspondence from him, uh, and that was unable to be broken. Uh, the experts felt that uh, there really wasn't a message within that uh, within that letter. Uh, of course, we've already submitted uh, this recent letter to our experts, and uh, if his name is there, I'm sure it will be, be revealed. Are you confident you will get him sooner or later? Well, of course, that's, uh, I feel that about all the murders we're involved in. I mean, that's our business and that's our job, and, uh, and uh, that's the only way to look at it and approach it, is that, uh, of course, eventually we'll get him. It conforms with all the other material we could receive from him in the past, yes. How can you tell it's authentic? Uh, it's a matter of identifying the handprinting appearing on the card. Where was this postcard postmarked from? Uh, it has no postmark on it. It was found in the post office. Postal workers found it before they, it even got through the cancellation machine. From all of your investigations, what can you tell us about the Zodiac? Uh, not a great deal. Uh, he's not an un unintelligent man by a long shot. Uh, his paragraphing, his phrasing, his punctuation is very good. I'm sure he has deliberately misspelled words in an attempt to lead us to believe that he's illiterate, but uh, in so doing, why he's led us to the point that we believe just the opposite. Of course, he hasn't tipped his hand to his real identity or whereabouts, has he? Well, he claimed he did in uh, he, one of his letters, uh, which contained a cryptogram, but so far we've had the cryptograms uh, all over the country and nobody's been able to break them yet.
Mr. Bell, I understand that historically this Telegraph Hill and your penthouse here has quite a history as far as extra legal activity is concerned. I don't you mean by extra legal? Errol Flynn's been up here, Catherine Hepburn, May West, uh, Rosanna Brazzi, Tony Curtis. Is that what you mean by extra legal? No, no. All legal <laughs> while they were here, but it's <laughs> kind of extra. Caesar is with me now, and we sort of batch up here. I need a housekeeper very badly. I hope I can get uh, Winnie Judd, or who if she is out there, she could be our housekeeper. One of your clients. What I was referring Caesar's to... Caesar's very corny. He says she's quite a cut-up sometime, and that I had to put him down for last night. Oh. That's real cornball. <laughs> what I meant was about the old history of crime and corruption that is part of that heritage. This part of San Francisco, the, the Telegraph Hill around here, was inhabited by what they called the, the Sydney Ducks. Those were remittance men, those were convicts from Australia. And they stayed up here. See, so they stayed in this area here, right where this house is, and then they'd go down once every two weeks into the city, the two or three blocks down there, and set fires, and rape, rob, pillage, and then you'd come back up on the hill, and the people of San Francisco, the police force, wasn't large enough and was afraid to come up here after these people here. This was, was the heart of the roughest, toughest uh, people in the world at that time. And now it, it, it's quiet, calm, bucolic. The only thing that stirs is, is the wind, Caesar and me, early in the morning. Well, it seems then that this is very conducive to... Uh your lifestyle. You have many artifacts and an entourage of people who visit you. Now you'll have to elaborate <laughs> on that. That you're not going to get me to rise to this being Fourth of July, and we're both very patriotic today. So we say nothing about ebullience of personality or manner of living. We're very quiet up here. Caesar and I are about the two quietest people in San Francisco last night. Well, we're going to fire the cannon off today. We're going to fire off three times. That's for three more years of Nixon. Then we can go back to the Declaration of Independence. Well, what about um, your sense of history and patriotism? Uh, how do you plan to uh, celebrate with your friends this July 4th holiday? Well, I think now most of our celebrations done with Jack Daniels and Jim Beam, but. Um, I, I, I think that it's uh, a holiday that is recognized and should be thought of as being uh, a typical American holiday. We remember our beginnings, that we're not, uh, we're, we're not a, a people that uh, are, are quiet, are harmonious. Uh, we're curious. And good heavens, you have to be curious. Now, we're going to the moon. We're doing all of these things. And yet they say, put the lid on and be quiet domestically. You don't put the lid on and be quiet domestically. Universities uh, just weren't institutions where everything was quiet. Uh, universities uh, since uh, B.C. were places where they had foment, where they had uh, revolution. So this is all something that has happened before. And I, I don't look at our generation as being a sick generation at all. I look at a generation and a country that's now trying to find, its, find itself in context of modernity has been a tremendous revolution in the law, that the law has now become modern. And I, say, I think it's all to the good.